Diablo Legacy of Blood Richard A. Knack One The skull gave them a lopsided grin as if cheerfully inviting the trio to join it for all eternity. Looks like we're not the first. Saving Tristan Ratward. The scarred sinewy fighter tapped the skull with one edge of his knife, causing the fleshless watcher to wobble. Behind the macabre sight, they could just make out the spike that had pierced their predecessor's head, leaving him dangling until time had let all but the skull drop to the floor in a confused heap. Did you think we would be? Whispered the tall, cowled figure. If Satan had a lean, almost acrobatic look to his build, Fawson seemed nearly cadaverous. The Vajerai sorcerer moved almost like a phantom as he, too, touched the skull, this time with one gloved finger. No sorcery here, though. Only crude, but sufficient mechanics. Nothing to fear. Unless it's your hat on the next pole. The Vajerai tugged at his thin gray goatee. His slightly slanted eyes closed once as if in acknowledgement to his partner's last statement. Where Satan had a continent more akin to an untrustworthy weasel, and sometimes a personality to match, Fotson reminded some of a withered cat, his nebula nose constantly twitching, and the whiskers hanging underneath that nose only added to the illusion. Neither had ever had a reputation for purity, but Nork would have trusted either with his life, and had several times over. As he joined them, the veteran warrior peered ahead to where a vast darkness hinted of some major chamber. Thus far, they had explored seven different levels in all, and found them curiously devoid of all but the most primitive traps. They had also found them devoid of any treasure whatsoever. A tremendous disappointment to the tiny party. Are you sure there's no sorcery about here, Fawson? None at all? The feline features, half hidden by the cowl, wrinkled further in mild defense. The wide shoulders of his voluminous cloak gave Fawson a foreboding, almost supernatural appearance, especially since he towered over the brawnier Nork, no small man himself. You have to ask that, my friend. It's just that it makes no sense. Other than a few minor and pretty pathetic traps, we've encountered nothing to prevent us from reaching the main chamber. Why go through all the trouble of digging this out, then leave us so sparsely defended? I don't call a spider as big as my head nothing. Satan interjected sourly, absently scratching his lengthy but thinning black hair. Especially as it was on my head at the time. Nark ignored him. Is it what I think? Are we too late? Is this Tristram all over again? Once before, between serving causes and mercenaries. They had hunted for treasure in a small, troubled village called Tristram. Legend had had it that in a lair guarded by fiends, there could be found a treasure so very extraordinary in value, it would make kings of those fortunate enough to live to find it. Nork and his friends had journeyed there, entering the labyrinth in the dead of night without the knowledge of the local populace. And... After all their efforts, after battling strange beasts and narrowly avoiding deadly traps, they had found that someone else had stripped the underground maze of nearly anything of value. Only upon returning to the village had they learned the sorry truth that a great champion had descended into the labyrinth but a few weeks before the supposedly slain the terrible demon Diablo. He had taken no gold or jewels, 
but other adventurers who had arrived shortly thereafter had made good use of his handiwork, dealing with the lesser dangers and carrying off all they could find. But a few days difference had left the trio with nothing to show for their efforts. Nork himself had also taken no consolation in the words of one villager of dubious sanity who had, as they had prepared to depart, warned that the champion, so-called the Wanderer, had not defeated Diablo, but rather had accidentally freed the foul evil. A questioning glance by Nork toward Fotsen had been answered at first with an indifferent shrug by the Vajara Sorcerer. There are always stories of escaping demons and terrible curses, Potson had added at the time, completely dismissal of the wild warning in his tone. Diablo is generally in the most of the favorites, whispered among common folk. You don't think that there's anything to it? As a child, Nork had grown up being scared by his elders with tales of Diablo, Bale, and other monsters of the night. All stories designed to make him be good. Saving Trist snorted. <laughs> you ever seen a demon yourself? Know anyone that had? Nork had not. Oh, have you, Fossin? They said Vajara can summon demons to do their bidding. If I could do that, do you think I would be scrounging in empty labyrinths and tombs? And that comment, more than anything else, had convinced Dork then to chuck the villagers' words down as yet another tall tale. In truth, it had not been hard to do. After all, the only thing that had mattered then to the three had been what mattered now. Well, unfortunately, it seemed more and more likely once again those riches had eluded him. As he peered down the passage, Fotson's other gloved hand tightened around the spell staff he wielded. The jewel top, the source of their light, said briefly, I had hoped I was wrong, but now I fear it is so. We are far from the first to delve this deep into this place. The slightly graying fighter swore under his breath. He had served under many a commander in his life, most of them during the Crusades from Westmarch, and from surviving those various campaigns, often by the skin of his teeth, he had come to one conclusion. No one could hope to rise in the world without money. He had made it as far as captain, been broken in rank thrice, then finally retired in disgust after the last debacle. War had been Nork's life since he had been old enough to raise a sword. Once, he had also had something of a family. They were now as dead as his ideas. He still considered himself a decent man, but decency did not fill one's stomach. There had to be another way. Nork had decided. And with so, with his two comrades, he had gone in search of treasure. Like Satan, he had a share of scars, but Nork's visage otherwise resembled more than of a simple farmer. Wide brown eyes with a broad open face and a strong jaw, he would have looked more at home behind a hoe. Yet while that vision occasionally appealed to the sturdy veteran, he knew that he needed the gold to pay for that land. This quest should have led them to riches far beyond his needs, far beyond his dreams. Now it seemed as if it had all been a waste of time and effort. Again. Beside him, Sadie Triss tossed his knife into the air, then expertly caught it at the hilt as it fell. As he did this twice more clearly, thinking Nora could just imagine what he thought about. They had spent months on this particular quest, journeying across the sea to the northern Kedjistan, sleeping in the cold and rain, following false trails and empty caves, 
eating whatever vermin they could find when other hunting proved scarce. And all because of Nork, the one who had instigated this entire fiasco. Worse, this quest had actually come about because of a dream. A dream concerning a wicked mountain peak, bearing some crude resemblance to a dragon's head. Had he dreamt it only once, perhaps twice, Nork might have forgotten the image. But over the years, it had repeated itself far too many times. Wherever he had fought, Nork had watched for the peak, but to no avail. Then, a comrade, later dead, from these chill northern lands, had made mention of such a place in passing. Ghosts were said to haunt it, and men who traveled near the mountain often disappeared, or were discovered later, flesh stripped from their shattered bones. There and then, Nord Vizran had been certain that destiny had tried to call him here. But if so, why had Tum already vandalized? The entrance had been well hidden in the rock face, but definitely open to the outside. This should have been his first clue to the truth. Yet Nork had refused to even see the discrepancy. All his hopes, all his promises to his companions. Tim! He kicked at the nearest wall. Only a sturdy boot saving him from a few broken toes. Nork threw his sword to the ground, continuing to curse his naivety. There's some new general from Westmont driving on mercenaries, Satan hopefully suggests. They say he's got big ambitions. No more war, muttered Nork, trying not to show it, the pain coursing through his foot. No more trying to die for other people's glory. I just thought... The leaky sorcerer tapped the ground once with his staff, seeking the attention of both his earthier partners. At this point... It would be foolish not to go on to the central chamber. Perhaps those who were here before us left a few bubbles or coins. We did find a few gold coins in Tristram. Certainly it would not hurt to search a little longer. What did Norik? He knew that Vajara only sought to assuade his friend's bitter emotions. But still the idea managed to take root in the veteran's mind. All he needed were a few gold coins. He was still young enough to take a bride, to get a new life, maybe even raise family. Nork picked up his sword, hefting the weapon that had served him so well over the years. He had kept it cleaned and honed, taking pride in one of the few items truly his own. A look of determination spread across the visage. Let's go. You have a way with words for one using so few. Sid ingested it to the sorcerer as they started off. And you'll use so many words for one using four worth, words worth worth saying. The friendly argument between his companions helped settle Nork's troubled mind. And reminded him of other times between the three of them when they had persevered through worse difficulties. Yet the talk died as they approached what surely had to be the last and most significant chamber. Flotsam called a halt, staring briefly at the jewel atop the staff. Before we proceed inside, the two of you had better light torches. They had saved the torches for emergencies, the sorcerer's staff serving well until now. Flotsam said no more, but as Nork used tinder to light his, he wondered if the Vajarai had finally noted sorcery of some significance. If so, then perhaps there still remains some sort of treasure. With his own torch lit, Nork used it to set Satan's ablaze. Now surrounded with more secure illumination, the trio set off again. I swear, grumbled Wiry Satan a few moments later. I swear that the hair on the back of my head is standing on its end. Nark felt the same. Neither fighter argued when the Vajara took the lead. The clans of the Far East had long studied the magical arts, and Fox's people had studied them longer than most. 
if a situation arose where sorcery had to take a hand, certainly it made sense to leave it to the thin spellcaster. Nork and Satan would be there to guard him from other assaults. The arrangement had worked so far. Unlike the heavy boots of the warriors, the sandaled feet of Fotsin made no sound as he walked. The mage stretched forth his staff, and Nork noticed that, despite his power, the jewel failed to illuminate much. Only the torches seemed to act as they could. This is old and very powerful. Our predecessors may not have been so fortunate as we first believed. We may find some treasure yet. And possibly more. Nork's grip on the sword tightened to the point that his knuckles whined. He wanted gold, but he also wanted to live to spend it. With the staff proving unreliable, the two fires took to the front. That did not mean that Foxen would no longer be of any aid to the band. Even now, the veteran knew his magical companion thought out the quickest, sure spell for whatever they might encounter. It looks as dark as the grave in there, Satan mumbled. Nark said nothing, now a few steps ahead of the both of his comrades. He became the first to actually reach the chamber itself. Despite the dangers that might lurk within, he almost felt drawn to it, as if something inside called to him. A blinding brilliance overwhelmed the trio. God, Scott! Snapped Satan. I can't see! Give it a moment, cautioned the sorcerer. It will pass! And so it did. But as his eyes adjust, Norg Vizran at last beheld a sight so remarkable that he had to bleed twice to make certain that it was not a figment of his desires. The walls were covered in intricate jeweled patterns in which even he could sense the magic. Precious stones of every type and hue abound in each pattern, blanketing the chamber in an astonishing display of refracted and reflected colors. In addition, below those magical symbols were no less eye-catching were the very treasures for which the trio had come. Mounds of gold, mounds of silver, mounds of jewels. They added to the overall glitter, making the chamber brighter than day. Each time either fighter shifted his torch, the lighting further altered the appearance of the room, adding new dimensions equally as startling as the last. Yet, as breathtaking as all this looked, one shocking sight dampened Nork's enthusiasm greatly. Thrown across the floor, as far as you can see, were the many mangled and decaying forms of those who has preceded him and his friends to this foreboding place. Satan held his torch toward the nearest one, an almost fleshless corpse, still clad in rotting leather armor. There must have been some battle here. These men did not die all at the same time. Nork and the smaller soldier looked to Fossen, who had a troubled expression on his generally emotionless countenance. What's that you mean? I mean, say then, that most of them have been clearly dead for far longer. Even centuries. This one near your feet is one of the newest. Some of those over there are but bones. This light warrior shrugged. Either way, for it looks like they've all died pretty nasty. There is that. So, what killed them? Here, Nora Look there. I think they've slain each other. The two corpses he pointed at each had blades thrust into one another's midsections. One with his mouth still open in what seemed a last horrified cry, wore garments akin to the other mummified body by Satan's feet. The other wore only scraps of clothing, 
and only a few strands of hair covered by an otherwise clean skeleton. You must be mistaken, Devagera replied with a slight shake of his head. The one warrior is clearly much older than the other. So Nork would have supposed, if not for the blade thrust in the other corpse's torso. Still the deaths of the two men long, long ago had little bearing on present circumstances. Thoughts and do you sense anything? Is there some sort of trap here? The gaunt figure held his step before the chamber for a moment, then lowered it again in disgust quite evident. There are too many conflicting forces in here. Nork. I can get no accurate sense of what to seek. I sense nothing directly dangerous. Yet, to the side, saying fairly hot about an impatience. So, so, do we leave all this? We want our dreams? Or we take a little risk and gather ourselves a few empires worth of coin? Nork and the sorcerer exchanged glances. Neither could see any reason not to continue, especially with so many enticements before them. The veteran warrior finally settled the matter by taking a few steps farther into the master chamber. When no great bolt of lightning nor demonic creature struck him down, Satan and the Vajera quickly followed suit. Must be a couple dozen at least. Satan leapt over two skeletal corpses still trapped in struggle. And that's not counting the ones in little pieces. Satan, shut your mouth or I'll do it for you. Now that he actually walked among them, Nork wanted no more discussion concerning the dead treasure hunters. It still bothered him that so many had clearly died violently. Surely someone had survived. But if so... Why did the coins and the other treasure look virtually untouched? And then something else tore his thoughts from those questions. Sudden realization that beyond the treasure, at the very far end of the chamber, a dais stood atop a naturally formed set of steps. More important, atop that dais lay Mortal remains still clad in armor. Thoughts, man. Once the mage had come to his side, Nord pointed to the dais and muttered, What do you make of that? Fotson's only reply was to purse his thin lips and carefully make his way toward the platform. Nord followed close behind. It would explain so much, he heard the Vajari whisper. It would explain so many conflicting magical signatures and so many signs of power. What are you talking about? The sorcerer finally looked back at him. Come closer and see for yourself. Norik did just that. The sense of unease that had earlier filled him now amplified as the veteran peered at the macabre display atop the platform. He had been a man of military aspirations. That much Nork could at least tell. Even if of the garments only a few tattered remains existed, the fine leather boots lay tipped to each side, pieces of the pants sticking out of them. What likely had been once a silk shirt could barely be seen under the majestic breastplate laying askew on the ribcage. Underneath that, blackened bits of a formerly regal robe covered much of the upper half of the platform. Well-crafted gauntlets and gutter-shaped plates, van braces, gave the illusion of arms still sinewy and flesh-bound, whereas other plates, these overlapping, did the same for the shoulders. Less successful was the armor on the legs, which along with the bones there lay askew as if something had disturbed them at some point. Do you see? 
bought some masks. Not certain exactly what he meant. Nork squinted. Other than the fact that the armor itself seemed colored in an unsettling yet familiar shade of red, he could see nothing that would have... No head. The body on the dais? Head? No head. Nork glanced past the dais. Saw no trace on the floor. You made mention of that to the sorcerer. Yes, it is exactly as described. The lanky figure swept toward the platform, almost too eager in the veteran's mind. Foxes stretched out a hand, but held back at the very last moment from touching what lay upon it. The body placed with the top to the north, the head and the helm separated already in battle, now separated in time and distance in order to ensure an absolute end to the matter. The marks of power set into the walls, there to counter and contain the darkness still within the, the corpse. But... But... Thotson's voice trailed off as he continued to stare. But what... The mage shook his head. Nothing, I suppose. Perhaps just being so near to him unsettles my nerves more than I'd like to admit. By now, somewhat exasperated with Botson's murky words, Nor gritted his teeth. So, who is he? Some prince? By heaven, no! Do you not see? One gloved figure pointed at the red breastplate. This is the last tomb of Bartok, Lord of Demons, Master of Darkest Sorcery. The Warlord of Blood. The words escaped Norik as little more than a gasp. He knew very well the tales of Bartok, who had risen among the ranks of sorcerers, who too later to turn to the darkness to the demons. Now the redness of the armor made perfect and horrible sense. It was the color of human blood. In his madness, Bartek, who even the demons had first seduced him, had evidently come to fear, had bathed himself before each battle in the blood of previously fallen foes. His armor once brilliant gold had become forever stained by a sinful axe. He had raised cities to the ground, committed atrocities unbounded, and would have continued on forever. So the stories went, if not for the desperate acts of his own brother, Horizon and the other Vajera sorcerers who had used what knowledge they had retained of the ancient, more natural magics to defeat the fiend. Bartek and his demon host had been slaughtered just short of victory. The warlord himself decapitated just in the midst of casting a dire counterspell. Still untrusting of his brother's vast power, even in death, Horizon had commanded that Bartok's body be forever hidden from the sight of men. Why they had not simply burned it, nor did not know. But certainly he would have tried. Regardless, rumors had arisen shortly thereafter of places where the warlord of blood had been laid to rest. Many had sought out his tomb, especially those of the black arts interested in possible lingering magic, but no one had ever claimed to truly find it. The Vajirai likely knew more detail than Nork, but the veteran fighter understood all too well what they had found. Legend had it that, for a time, Bartok had lived among Nork's own people, that perhaps some of those with whom the soldier had grown up had been in fact, descendants of the monstrous deposits followers. Yes, Nork knew very well the legacy of the warlord. He shuddered, and without thinking,
began to back away from the dais. Botson, we're leaving this place. But surely, my friend, we're leaving. The cow figure studied Nork's eyes and then nodded. Perhaps you are right. Grateful Nork turned to his other companion. Satan, forget about everything. We're leaving here now. Something near the shadowed mouth of the chamber caught his attention. Something that moved and that was not Satan Trist. The third member of the party presently engaged himself in trying to fill a sack with every manner of jewel he could find. Satan! Snapped the older fighter. Chop the sack! Quick! The thing near the entrance shuffled forward. Are you mad? Satan called, not even bothering to look over his shoulder. This is all we've ever dreamed about! A clatter of movement caught Nork's attention. A clatter of movement from more than one direction. He swallowed as the original figure moved better into view. The empty eye sockets of the mummified warrior they had first stepped over greeted his own terrified gaze. Satan! Look to your back! Now, at last, he had his partner's attention. The wiry soldier chopped the sack instantly, whirling about and pulling his blade free. However, when he saw what both Nork and Fatsun already faced, Satan's tryst countenance turned as pale as bone. One by one, they began to rise from corpse to skeleton. Those who had preceded the trio to this tomb. Now Nork understood why no one had ever left alive and why he and his friends might soon be added to the grisly ranks. Kosol Rock! One of the skeletons nearest to the sorcerer vanished in a burst of orange flame. Fawcett pointed a finger at another. A half clad ghoul with some traces of his former face still remaining. The Vajera repeated the ward of power. Nothing happened. My spell! Stunned thoughts and failed to notice another skeleton on his left. Now raising a rusted but still serviceable sword and clearly intending to sever the mage's head from his body. Watch it! Nork deflected the blow, then thrust. Unfortunately, his attack did nothing. The blade simply passing through the ribcage. In desperation, he kicked at his horrific foe, sending the skeleton crashing into another of the shambling undead. They were outnumbered several times over by foes who could not be slain by normal means. Nork saw Satan, cut off from his two friends, leap to the top of a mound of coins and try to defend himself from two nightmarish warriors. One a cadaverous husk, the other a partial skeleton with one good arm. Several more closed in from behind those two. Fawson, can you do anything? I'm trying a different spell. Again, the Vajera called out a word. This time, the two creatures battling with Satan froze in place. Not one to miss such an opportunity. Trust swung at the pair with all his might. Both ghouls shattered into countless pieces. Their entire top halves shattered on the stone floor. Your powers are back! Nork's hope rose. They never left me. I fear I only have one chance to use each spell. And most of those still remaining take much time to cast. Nork had no chance to comment on the terrible news. 
for his own situation had grown even more desperate. He traded quick strikes with the first one, then two of the encroaching ranks of undead. The ghouls seemed slow in reaction, for which he gave some thanks, but numbers and perseverance would eventually pay off for these ghastly guardians of the warlord's tomb. Those who had planned this last trap had planned well. For each party that entered added to the ranks that would attack the next. Nor could imagine where the first undead had come from. He had remarked to his friends early on that all the three had come across sprung traps and dead creatures. No bodies had been found until the skull with the spike in its head. The first party to discover Bartek's tomb surely had lost some of its numbers on the trek inside, never knowing that those dead comrades would become the survivor's greatest nightmare. And so, with each new group, the ranks of guardians had grown, with Nork, Satan, and Fotson now set to be added. One of the mummified corpses cut at Nork's left arm. The veteran used the torch in his other hand to ignite the dry flesh, turning the zombie into a walking inferno. Risking his foot, Nork kicked the fiery creature into its comrade. Despite that success, though, the horn of unliving continued to press all three back. Nork! shouted Satan from somewhere. Foxen, they're coming at me from everywhere! Neither could help him, though both as harried. The mage beat off one skeleton with a staff, but two more were quickly filled in that space left. The creatures had begun to move with more fluidity and greater swiftness. Soon, no advantage whatsoever would remain for Norik and his friends. Separating him from Fawcett, three ghoulish warriors pressed Norik Vizrin up the steps and finally against the dais. The bones of the warlord of blood rattled in the armor, but much to the hard-pressed veteran's relief, Bartuk did not rise to command this infernal army. A flash of smoke alerted him to the fact that the sorcerer had managed to deal with yet another of the undead, but Nork knew that Foxen could not handle all of them. So far, neither of the fighters had managed much more than a momentary stalemate. Without flesh for their blades to penetrate, without vital organs that could be skewered, knives and swords meant nothing. The thought of one day rising as one day one of these to slay the next hapless intruders sent a shiver down Nork's spine. He moved along the side of the dais as best as he could, trying to find some path by which to escape. To his shame, Nork knew that he would have happily abandoned his comrades if the opening to freedom had abruptly materialized. His strength flagged. A blade caught him in the thigh. The pain not only made him cry out, Aah! but caused Nora to lose his grip on the sword. The weapon clattered down the steps, disappearing behind the encroaching ghouls. His leg nearly buckling, Nork waved the torch at the oncoming attackers with one hand, while his other sought some hold on the platform. However, instead of sound, his grasping fingers took hold of cold metal that offered no support whatsoever. His wounded leg finally gave out. Nork slipped to one knee, pulling the metallic object he had accidentally grabbed with him. The torch flew away. A sea of grotesque faces filled the warrior's horrified view as Nork attempted to right himself. The desperate treasure hunter raised the hand with which he had tried to garner some hold, as if by silently beseeching the undead for mercy, he could forestall the inevitable. Only at the last did he realize that his hand had raised now and had somewhat become clad in metal. A gauntlet. The very same gauntlet that he had earlier seen on the skeleton of Bartok. Even as the start of the discovery registered in his mind, a word that Nork did not understand ripped forth from his mouth, echoing throughout the chamber. The jeweled patterns in the walls flared bright, brighter, and the unearthly foes of the trio froze in place. Another word 
This one, even less intelligible, burst free from the stunned veteran. The patterns of power grew blinding, burning, and exploded. A fearsome wave of pure energy tore through the chamber, coursing over the undead. Shards flew everywhere, forcing Nork to fold himself into as small bundle as possible. He prayed that the end would soon be relatively quick and painless. The magic consumed the undead where they stood. Bones and dried flesh burned as readily as oil tender. Their weapons melted, creating piles of slag and ash. Yet, it did not touch any of the party. What's happening? What's happening? He heard Satan cry. The infernal moved with acute precision, sweeping over the tomb's guardians, but nothing else. As their numbers dwindled, so too did the intensity of the force, until at last neither remained. The chamber became plunged into near darkness. The only illumination now, the two torches, and the little bit of light reflected by the many ruined stones. Nork gaped at the devastating results, wondering what he had just wrought, and whether somehow it heralded an even more terrible situation. He then stared down at the gauntlet, afraid to leave it on, but equally fearful of what might happen if he tried to remove it. They... They have all been devoured. Fotson managed, the Vajari forcing himself up to his feet. His robe had been cut in many places, and the thin mage held one arm where blood still flowed over a nasty wound. Satan hopped down from where he had been battling. Remarkably, he looked entirely uninjured. But how? How indeed. Nork flexed his gloved fingers. The metal felt almost like a second skin, far more comfortable than he could have thought possible. Some of the fear faded as the possibilities of what else he might be able to do became more obvious. Norik, came Fonson's voice. When did you put that on? He paid no attention, instead thinking that it might be interesting to try the other gauntlet. Better yet, the entire suit, and see how it felt. As a young recruit, he had once dreamed of rising to the rank of general and garnering his riches through victory in battle. Now that old, long faded dream seemed fresh and, for the first time, so very possible. A shadow loomed over his hand. He looked up to see the sorcerer eyeing him in concern. Norik, my friend, perhaps you should take off that glove. Take it off? Suddenly the notion of doing so made absolutely no sense to the soldier. The gauntlet had been the only thing that saved their lives. Why take it off? Could it, could it be that the Vajera simply coveted it for himself? And thanks, Magic Fotson's kind knew no loyalty. If Nork did not give him the gauntlet, the odds were that Fotson might simply take it when his comrade could not stop him. A part of the veteran's mind tried to dismiss the hateful notions. Fotson had saved his life more than once. He and Satan were Nork's best and only friends. The Eastern Mage would certainly not try something so base. Would he? Nork! Listen to me, an edge of emotion, perhaps envy, perhaps fear, touched the other's voice. It is vital right now that you take that gauntlet off. We shall put it back on the platform. What is it? Said it called. What's wrong with him? Watson? Nort became convinced that he had been right the first time. The sorcerer wanted his glove. Satan, ready your blade. We may have to... My blade? You want me to use it on Norik? Something within the older fighter took control. 
Nork watched as if from a distance, as the gauntleted hand darted out and caught the Vajera by the throat. Satan! His wrist! Got it! Out of the corner of his eye, Nork saw his other companion hesitate, then raised his weapon to attack. A fury such as had never experienced consumed the veteran. The world grew a bloody red, then turned to an utter blackness. And in that blackness, Nork Vizran heard screams.